the sound of ocean surf, of waves, a natural sound most people find pleasing and relaxing. It is a sound of natural energy, a natural energy always present when the ocean meets the shore, the sound of waves of energy in action. We all know that government agencies can be somewhat shady at times. Through the years, countless declassified documents shed light on the CIA's interest in and their difficult relationship to altered states of consciousness. At least since the publication of the MKUltra project, that's no longer news. Recently, I came across a declassified document from the year 1983 titled Analysis and Assessment of the Gateway Process. And let me tell you, it's something else. To give you an idea before we dive into it, let me outline the basic premise. In this document, the so-called gateway process or the gateway tapes are discussed, a technique with which one can achieve altered states of consciousness, out-of-body experiences and astral projection, ascending through the fabric of reality and escaping space-time itself. These things are achieved by listening to a series of tapes by Robert Monroe and are based heavily on the theories of author, inventor and mystic Itztag Bentov. But before we go on, I'll have to put out a disclaimer. A lot of what is discussed in the Gateway Files and this video is tinged heavily by mysticism, spirituality and the theoretic framework built by basically one man. Bentov draws from many fields including quantum physics to back up his claims and it can get difficult to validate or discredit or simply follow any of his claims if you're not exactly an expert in these fields. Some of what he extrapolates is, from a rational point of view, a bit farther out. Regardless, I think it's worth listening to what he has to say, whether you believe his theory or not. In the end, you'll have to decide for yourself which parts of his claims you'll buy into and which ones you don't. Also, as you probably saw, this video will be quite long and it gets a bit technical at times, so just bear with me here. Maybe grab a few snacks and just settle in. Now, let's start at the beginning. To understand what makes the gateway process unique, we'll have to mention that the altered states Ichtag Bentov describes and the things you can do with them can be achieved through other techniques as well that operate on somewhat the same principles. It all starts with the brain, or to be precise, the brainwave patterns corresponding to different states of mind like our normal waking consciousness as well as sleep or meditative states. Robert Monroe, founder of the Monroe Institute, is known for quote-unquote inventing the term out-of-body experience in his 1971 book Journeys Out of the Body. Even though the technique itself has been known to different civilizations for thousands of years of course. What Monroe discovered however is that you can induce a state of synchronized brainwave patterns of the right and left brain hemisphere he later called hemisync. This concept is the underlying principle of the various gateway tapes spawned from his research into awareness. Describing his technique, he compared it to a ramp from the local road to the interstate of the exploration of consciousness. Compare that to Freud's notion of dreams, themselves an altered state of awareness as the royal road to the subconscious. Hemisync and the gateway tapes are meant to be a shortcut and a reliable way for untrained individuals to achieve trends like meditative states that would otherwise take methodical and prolonged practice in teachings like the Zen Buddhist tradition. Now, let's get into the actual file that resurfaced in 2003. It starts off with outlining a few other techniques to give a better understanding of the underlying principles of the gateway process. Lieutenant Colonel Wayne Mac... Oh shit, digger. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Wayne M. Macdonnell, the author of the gateway paper, states, The most effective way to begin is to briefly profile the basic mechanics which underlay operation of the related methods. It is easiest to effectively describe what Gateway is by beginning with a short description of those techniques that share some common aspects with the Gateway experience. In this way, we can develop a frame of reference at the outset, which will provide useful concepts to explain and understand Gateway by comparison. These techniques include Our brain's functions are subdivided between the right and left brain hemispheres. The left hemisphere is described as the linear reasoning part of our brain, its focus is to screen incoming stimuli and assign certain meaning before letting information pass on to the right hemisphere. That one is responsible for intuition, the non-verbal and pattern-recognizing part of ourselves. Now, under hypnosis, the goal is to disengage or distract the left brain so stimuli, including hypnotic suggestions, can reach the right side of our brain. 
There we can find a number of points that correspond with certain locations in the body. Here it's ominously called the homunculus. And by targeting certain points combined with the right suggestion, like a certain emotion or sensation such as numbness, that will trigger a response in the actual body. Transcendental meditation is all about concentration and drawing up energy through the spinal cord, like Bentoff describes it. Through the altered heartbeat, a kind of wave is created that reaches the brain and polarizes it in a way. According to Bentoff, this bringing up the Kundalini is also possible under prolonged exposure to vibrations between 4 to 7 Hz. He compares it to riding in a car with a seatbelt in just the right position or standing under an air conditioning duct. Now, if you really can become enlightened by standing too close to an air conditioning duct for too long, I have no idea. But the theory Bentoff draws from is a very real one. The method of Kundalini Yoga has been practiced for countless generations in the Eastern tradition. The way the ancient texts describe it, we have a vast repository of energy curled up at the base of our spine, at the Mulatara Chakra. As it ascends through the different gates, the energy centers of our bodies, it makes its way to the top of our head, the crown chakra, and we become enlightened. At least that's the theory in a nutshell. In reality, there still seems to be a difference between the true enlightenment or moksha through the Bindu Visarga, which we'll get back to in a bit, and the Kundalini awakening. Some who were not guided properly describe symptoms of being almost mad or possessed by a kind of foreign energy, but that's neither here nor there. The last somewhat related principle the paper talks about is biofeedback. Instead of suppressing or bypassing the left hemisphere like in the previous methods, it focuses on creating a path between the desired result and the sensation to consistently activate the right hemisphere. This largely works by relying on memory recall, affirmations and repetition. With this technique one can, for example, consciously increase blood flow in parts of their body, raise or lower their own temperature and achieve a deep meditative state without having to train in special meditation techniques for a long time. After having mentioned these principles, we now get to what the techniques of the gateway process actually involve. The gateway experience is a training system designed to bring enhanced strength, focus and coherence to the amplitude and frequency of brainwave output between the left and right hemisphere so as to alter consciousness, moving it outside the physical sphere, so as to ultimately escape even the restrictions of time and space. That's the official statement. The hemisync technique employed by the Monroe Institute is paramount to this process. In ordinary consciousness, the state of synchronization between hemispheres is rare and short-lived. However, according to studies done by Elma and Alice Green at the Menninger Foundation, People who, for example, have long training in teachings like Zen meditation are able to induce this state of hemisync consistently and sustain it for prolonged periods of time. Melissa Jager, chief instructor of the Gateway program at the Monroe Institute, gives us a useful metaphor for understanding how hemisync acts upon the brain. She compares normal waking consciousness to a lamp, which gives off heat and light in a disorderly, chaotic manner. The energy is diffused over a wide area. Now, with the help of synchronization, we can focus that stream of energy into a narrow band and eventually we will end up with a kind of laser with a uniform frequency and amplitude. Once we achieve that unison, it's possible to accelerate both frequency and amplitude so the mind is resonating at ever higher vibrational levels. Then it's possible to synchronize or tune into different energy levels that exist in the universe. And when the mind is operating on these levels, the theory states it's possible to retrieve, process and assign meaning to information gathered on these planes. Such meaning is usually perceived visually in the form of symbols, but may also be perceived as astonishing flashes of holistic intuition or even in the form of scenarios involving both visual and oral perception. That kind of holistic intuition could also be described as a form of noetic insight the noetic quality being one of the four hallmarks of the mystical experience. Okay, so how do we actually achieve this synchronization? Well, to understand how it works, we'll have to talk about what's called the frequency following response, or FFR for short. Long story short, the brain has this capacity to emulate certain frequencies it hears that correspond to some of its own operational modes. If you're awake, for example, and your brain hears frequencies on the theta level, which correspond to your brainwave output when you sleep, the brain will automatically try to mimic the frequency it hears, and given you don't resist, you can actually fall asleep, or at least fall asleep faster that way. 
that's the whole basis behind the YouTube trend of subliminal audio or data frequencies to fall asleep to. Now, the problem is that the frequencies we want to produce are outside the spectrum we can actually hear with our ears. So the gateway tapes exploit another brain function we have, our ability to detect beat frequencies or the difference between two frequencies played at the same time. When we play a frequency in the left ear that's 10 Hz below the one on the right, our brain doesn't hear the two different frequencies, it hears the difference between them. The goal here is to relax the left hemisphere and place the body into a hypnagogic sleep state where our body is functionally asleep but our mind is still awake. Besides the use in the gateway tapes, this method is used in the yogic tradition as a first step towards astral projection, as well as the so-called wild technique in lucid dreaming, or to return to the west, hypnopedia. That means learning through audio in your sleep, which was all the rage in the middle of the 20th century, and also one of the topics Robert Monroe studied before he came up with the gateway premise. The theory of different frequency levels in the universe is also a concept seen across cultures. Whether you look at it through the scientific lens of different vibrations corresponding to different states of consciousness like wakefulness, sleep and dreaming, or if you go the spiritual route and see within the frequency levels the different chakric vibrations of the universe, the culturally omnipresent OM being the basic frequency of all things. But why is this whole frequency thing relevant to the gateway process specifically? By achieving a physical state of rest within the body, we eliminate what Bentov calls the bifurcation echo, so the sound of the heartbeat travels harmoniously throughout the body about 7 times per second. It's a real hassle to visualize, so to give you a quick rundown of what happens, through bringing the body into a relaxed state, the heart changes its rhythm and instead of an interference pattern caused by the pulse, we get a regular rhythmic sine wave pattern that travels through the body and resonates in the brain. It makes the brain oscillate or vibrate in a specific way. Between the brain and the skull we got different layers of membranes and fluids, so through achieving this regular pattern the brain moves about 0.005 to 0.010 millimeters. Now Benthoff says that this way our body becomes one vibrational system that transfers energy between 6.8 to 7.5 Hz into the Earth's ionospheric cavity. Just imagine it as a layer around the Earth. And this layer, through an absurdly complicated physical process, resonates at 7 to 7.5 Hz itself. I'd love to explain how that works, but honestly I don't quite understand it myself. It's been a few years since I've been to a physics class. The way I understand it, however, is that our output of low frequency vibrations merges with the electrostatic field of the Earth. Luckily, Bentov himself gives us his interpretation. This is occurring at a very long wavelength of about 40,000 kilometers, or just about the perimeter of the planet. In other words, the signal from the movement of our bodies will travel around the world in about one seventh of a second through the electrostatic field in which we are embedded. Such a wavelength knows no obstacles and its strength does not attenuate much over large distances. It is the ideal medium for conveying a telepathic signal. Now, if all that sounds awfully complicated, just let me warn you, it gets worse. Bentov really likes his physics. But in order to get to the good part, just bear with me for a bit, because it's important for understanding what he even talks about in the latter half of the paper. Now, following the premise that we have entered into a homogeneous system with our surroundings, according to the theory it should now be possible to move the seed of consciousness into the surrounding environment, because the two electromagnetic fields of us and the Earth are now a single energy continuum. What this means is out-of-body experience. To understand the more in-depth concepts behind the gateway process, it's important to establish a common understanding of how Bentov describes reality and how he views consciousness in particular. He tells us that the distinction between matter and energy as two distinctly different states of existence is misleading at best. If you look closely, there is no such thing as solid matter, and in fact the science seems to back him up on that. As most of us today know, when we get down to the realm of atoms, we discover they aren't stuck in one place, but rather exist in a probability wave function. I don't think I have to explain the double slit experiment or Schrodinger's cat to anyone. We are on the internet after all, I'm making an educated guess that most of the people that watch this video are familiar with the basics of uncertainty. Now, Bentov describes it as everything being oscillating energy grids that interact with each other and that states of matter are actually variances in the state of energy. 
Following that, he postulates consciousness is merely a function of the interaction of energy in two opposite states, motion and rest, in what he calls the hologram. The premise is also reminiscent of another theory, the theory of coalescence, in the framework of panpsychist philosophy. It says that everything is consciousness to some degree. In a certain amount of matter, there is an exponential amount of energy. That's also the reason atomic bombs work. But then it goes one step further and suggests that in energy there is an exponential amount of consciousness. So matter is condensed energy and energy is condensed consciousness. The fact we haven't discovered it yet doesn't necessarily mean the theory is false, it could just be we haven't discovered a scientific method to test for consciousness yet. Just a quick side note, the basis for most of the theory behind the gateway can be found in Benthoff's 1977 novel Stalking the Wild Pendulum. Bentov himself claims that most of the insights and ideas he had for the novel, as well as many of his inventions, came to him from the universal hologram. And what that is, we'll discover now. Energy creates, stores and retrieves meaning in the universe by projecting or expanding at certain frequencies in a three-dimensional mode that creates a living pattern called the hologram. To explain what he means, Bentov gives us an example to understand what holograms are. We have a bowl of water in which three pebbles are dropped. As the ripples created by the entry radiate outward, the surface of the water is flash frozen and removed. Then the ice is exposed to a laser. What we'll get is a three-dimensional model or representation of the position of the three pebbles in mid-air. The science behind the method of retrieving information in such a way stems from Dennis Gabor, who won a Nobel Prize in physics for his work in 1971. He's also called the father of holography. He developed the theory in 1947, but it couldn't be verified for years until the invention of the laser. In the Gateway paper, another example is cited by biologist Lyle Watson. The purest kind of light available to us is that produced by a laser, which sends out a beam in which all the waves are of one frequency, like those made by an ideal pebble in a perfect pond. When two laser beams touch, they produce an interference pattern of light and dark ripples that can be recorded on a photographic plate. And if one of the beams, instead of coming directly from the laser, is reflected first off an object, such as a human face, the resulting pattern will be very complex indeed, but it can still be recorded and read. The record will be a hologram of the face. The key to creating a hologram is that energy in a state of motion must interact with energy in a state of rest or non-motion. The pebble and the surface of the water, for example. To retrieve meaning, energy has to be passed through the interference pattern, what implications does this hold according to Bentov? Bear with me, this will get a bit confusing. Broadening our view, the entire universe can be seen as a complex set of interacting energy fields. It is in itself one gigantic hologram of unbelievable complexity. The electrostatic field of the mind receives energy passing through aspects of the universal hologram and creates a holographic image. It projects meaning in a sense that it reads the energy of the wave patterns passing through it. A decisive factor of how the holographic image is perceived and interpreted by the mind is dependent on its own frequency. One can imagine our brains as little radio antennas that pick up different frequencies and produce an output signal like a sound. Depending on what frequency we tune into, we can perceive different images or sounds that are out there. To return to the text, Changes in the frequency and amplitude of the electrostatic field, which comprises the human mind, determines the configuration and hence the character of the holographic energy matrix, which the mind projects to intercept meaning directly from the holographic transmission of the universe. Personally, I like my radio example better. To interpret the meaning of what was just received, the mind compares the image with itself, it compares it to memory. This touches on one of the biggest contemporary scientific debates, whether consciousness is emergent or created by the brain, or if the brain is more like a receiver of consciousness that exists outside of ourselves. This draws after it a bunch of mystical baggage like the illusion of the self or the state of non-duality and it's outlining the basic divide between a materialistic and idealistic worldview. In the paper, psychologist Keith Floyd is cited. Contrary to what everyone knows is so, it may not be the brain that produces consciousness, but rather consciousness that creates the appearance of a brain. The proposal that we perceive by comparison only is one of the pillars of Bentov's theory. 
He says our mind functions in much the same way a computer does, in a binary fashion that reduces a complex input into a two-dimensional form it can process and understand. We compare incoming information with data stored in our own memory. In altered states, the right hemisphere functions as the main receiver and the left one as the one processing the data. The overlapping function can be visualized as a consciousness energy grid. And once again, at face value, this coincides with new scientific discoveries. We now know that when we look at something, we don't really process all the information. Most of the work is handed down to comparing the impression of our senses with past experiences and making a predictive model or educated guesses. Our mind is constantly making comparisons and jumps to the most likely solution instead of laboriously crunching the sensory data each second. That's useful for conserving energy, but may not necessarily be the most accurate representation of our reality. One can see this distinction and comparison-making ability break down in transcendental states or psychedelic experiences where we are once again reduced to a state of wonder and a sense of newness and significance in everything. Concerning self-cognition, the paper differentiates between the human consciousness and that of plants and animals. We're not only aware, but we are aware that we're aware. That concept of meta-awareness can be attributed to our ability to duplicate and project outward parts of our own holograms, which we can then perceive and compare to ourselves in our memory. Up to this point, our discussion of the gateway process has been relatively simple and easy to follow. Uh, yeah. Now that we have all that boring stuff out of the way, we can delve deeper into the world of different dimensions, time travel, the shape of the universe, and even more quantum physics. In other words, now the fun begins. But before we get to the juicy parts of transcending space-time, we gotta define what time and space even are. According to our good friend physics here, time is nothing more than a measurement of energy or force in motion. In other words, it's a measurement of change. And in order for energy to be in motion, it must be limited to a certain range of vibrations. That way we have a pretty good idea of the area or rough location it exists in, one distinguishable from other locations. That we call space. In our current understanding, thermodynamics and entropy dictate the flow of time. It follows a path towards greater entropy. If Newton's laws can be violated, however, time may be able to be altered. Regarding the limitation of energy, the Gateway paper gives us this block of information and I'll read it in full because it's critical for pretty much everything that comes after it. Energy which is not confined is force without limit, without dimension, without the limits of form. It is infinity, cannot move because there is nothing beyond infinity and is therefore outside of the dimension of time. You know, because no movement means no change, no change, no time. It is also beyond space, because that concept implies that a specific energy form is limited to a specific location and is absent from others. But if energy is in the state of infinity, there are no boundaries, no here to differentiate from there, no sense of area. Energy in infinity means energy uniformly extended without limit. It has no beginning, no end, no location. It is conscious force, the fundamental primal power of existence without form, a state of infinite being. This energy in a state of inactive infinity is called energy in its absolute state, or simply the absolute. What else do we know about it? Apparently this absolute consciousness can still perceive passively whatever holograms the energy in the universe create, but it can be perceived by consciousness in these lower levels or dimensions. According to Bentov's theory, between the absolute and our material world there are layers we can gain access to in altered states, and we can continue to do so till we eventually reach the top, the absolute. But there, perception would stop because the absolute generates no hologram of or about itself. Remember, because it's in a state of total rest and can't exactly pass energy through itself if it's already everywhere and beyond the concept of space-time itself. When I first read this explanation of time and space, I immediately had to think of the Buddhist concept of Brahman, a kind of universal consciousness which we are all parts of, like little drops of water that got lifted from an ocean infinitely big. And after we leave this life, we'll merge with this oneness again. Later, Bentov even describes the concept with the analogy of a sea, but even more modern takes include this panpsychist vision of an all-mind or a mind at large, as famous English author Aldous Huxley described in his book Doors of Perception. There we follow the writer's first experience with mescaline, a psychedelic compound opening him up to a mystical experience in which his eponymous doors of perception get blown wide open. 
she adheres to Cambridge philosopher C.D. Broad's view of the mind as something limiting our perception of reality. Each person is in each moment capable of remembering all that has ever happened to him and of perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. The function of the brain is to protect us from being overwhelmed and confused by this mass of largely useless and irrelevant knowledge, by shutting out most of what we should otherwise perceive or remember, and leaving only that very small and special selection which is likely to be practically useful. Huxley compares the mind to a kind of reducing valve that restricts the abundant information to only the stuff necessary for our survival. Perception thus is rendered an evolutionary process. During his experience, Huxley also contemplates the teachings of the Buddha, experiencing the non-duality that comes with gaining enlightenment, ascending to the absolute or the mystical experience in general, as described by people as Meister Eckhart as far back as the 13th century, or arguably even far earlier with the writings of ancient Greek mystics like Heraclit. One thing that encapsulates this concept in Buddhist teachings especially is the Bindu Visarga or falling drop. It's a point at the very top of your head and the Buddhist law says it's a point of infinite density and energy, the source of unlimited consciousness. The collapse of all things into one point, which, if reached by the ascending energy of, for example, Kundalini Yoga, is released and consciousness expands infinitely. In other words, you'll receive Buddhahood, or perfect permanent enlightenment, Moksha. Now, how does ascending dimensions in the gateway process work? Let's find out. To enter these higher dimensions between our physical world and the state of the absolute, we have to accelerate our brain... Our brain wave... Oh, you know. To enter these higher dimensions between our physical world and the state of the absolute, we have to accelerate our brainwave output to an intense degree. This is critical for perception of non-time-space dimensions. And how is that possible? Are you an insane? What even is the Planck length? Well, the short answer is the smallest distance where physics still makes sense. Beyond that point it gets weird. The problem with the different Planck measurements is that they are somewhat describing nothing at all. The length that light travels in a Planck second is the Planck length, and the Planck second is the time it takes for light to travel the Planck length, so what does that even mean? The finer details aren't that important to us, but you could argue that here lies a definite weakness of the whole gateway theory. Anyway, when you look at a wave, like our brain waves, it has two points of rest where it changes directions. These are necessary because without these two limits, a periodical waveform wouldn't be possible. So for a brief moment, the wave has to be in a state of rest. Just before reaching that point of infinity where it changes directions, the waveform has to cross the barrier of Planck distance, roughly 10 to the negative 33 centimeters. Beyond that, our concept of time and space breaks down. In Bentov's word, we enter a new world. These moments of temporarily going beyond the limits of time and space are dubbed clickouts. Now, the trick is when you accelerate the wave to such an extent that these clickouts occur so often and so close to each other that you reach a virtual continuum beyond space time. The paper acknowledges that this clicking out is a critical part of the whole theory, so it spends quite some time explaining and justifying it. One example that is cited for exactly that principle of clicking out applying in nature is the concept of entanglement. After two particles collide or interact in any way, even if they are separated by half the universe, they can seemingly exchange information instantaneously, faster than light. According to Gateway, this is because the exchange of information happens beyond the clickout point, beyond space-time, and this way it doesn't violate Einstein's theory of relativity, which only applies to conventional time and space and nothing beyond. By the way, these guys won last year's Nobel Prize in Physics proving that quantum entanglement is indeed a real thing. If that also validates other parts of Bentov's theory is up for discussion. On a different note, there is a theory in development that concerns itself with particles that travel faster than light. Tachyons, from the Greek term tachys, literally meaning fast. However, their existence would cause quite a bit of trouble, opening the doors to time travel paradoxes and breaking Einstein's special relativity. Physicists don't like that. Going back to what we will actually find in these intermediate dimensions, it gets weird. Causality and proportionality between events in time and space breaks down and fluctuates. Movements become jerky rather than smooth. Time and space become grainy or chunky, 
Perhaps a piece of space can be traversed by a particle of matter in any direction without necessarily being synchronized with a piece of time. In short, a pair of events will occur in either time or space, the pair not being connected causally, but by a random fluctuation. The text skips over this rather important part, but leaves us with one side note. Access is open to both the past and the future when the dimensions of current time space is left behind. Before concerning ourselves with a much bigger scope of things, the paper briefly returns to out-of-body experience, mentioning the merit of starting from a point higher up, so to speak, which allows your consciousness to spend more time in the window beyond space-time, without needing to travel through the layers in between. It leaves us with Bentov's analogy of the consciousness as a sea. The storm-tossed waves on the surface are current reality. The currents between the agitated surface and the depths of the absolute, which are a total rest, represent the energy in the process of either entering or coming out of that state of total tranquility. What shape is the universe? Flat? Curved? Hyperbolic? Is it one giant ball growing ever larger into nothingness which doesn't even make sense? Well, according to Bentov, the answer is simple. The universe is a donut. Yeah, you heard me all right. The universe has the shape of a donut, or torus to be exact, an immense self-contained spiral, an ovoid or egg-like shape which at its center has a point of extremely compressed energy from which matter enters our universe through a white hole. Do white holes exist? Science says maybe? We haven't got proof, but in theory they are possible as they are the mathematical counterpart to black holes. You know, when you calculate a root and it has both a positive and a negative solution? Kinda like that. So Bentov saw that small things in nature mirror larger ones, like the orbit of electrons around a nucleus and planets around a sun. So he looked at quasars, which eject massive concentrated jets of matter and energy called quasar beams that could eradicate entire planets at light speed and he thought, hmm, I guess we can make that bigger. Make that jet of energy concentric and spread out in all directions and boom, you got the big bang as caused by a white hole. Energy that comes into existence through that process becomes more complex and it moves towards the far end of the egg, at which it exits the universe through a black hole. Time in this context is the measurement of change which occurs on this journey as energy travels along the shell of the egg. In other words, as energy, expelled from infinity and confined within limits by the conscious of the absolute, achieves form and motion following the ejection from the white hole at the top of the egg, Time begins as a measure of the cadence of this evolutionary movement as reality goes around the shell of the egg on its journey to the black hole at the far end. As energy is in motion like this, it creates an interference pattern, which in turn creates the universal hologram or torus. All of the movements of energy that make up the universe leave their mark and tell their story throughout time. The hologram can be read and this way it becomes possible to obtain knowledge about the past, present and future, as they all exist simultaneously within the torus at all times. As the future is dictated by past states, philosophers have been trying to create a model for predicting the future reliably for generations. Take for example Laplace's demon, who holds a kind of world formula. By knowing the place and situation of all the particles in the universe, it can predict the future perfectly. However, the uncertainty principle that is the basis of our current knowledge of quantum physics actually prevents any somewhat accurate predictions to be made beyond an instantaneous moment. The existence of the universe in this constant state of going from creation to destruction from a black-white hole duality eerily represents our modern theory of the big bounce. The big bang happening over and over and over again and each time creating a new material reality. A new universe with another you in it, perpetually playing out the same, endlessly repeating game of life. Where does all this put us, our consciousness? Our awareness, our consciousness is the basis for everything. It is the organizing and guiding principle that brings and keeps energy in motion so a specific reality results. We are parts of the absolute, a drop in the sea of Brahman or the absolute, the mind at large. We have self-awareness and so does the absolute, but in case of the latter it is a function of energy and consciousness in infinity, omniscience and omnipotence in perceptual unity. When energy returns to a state of total rest within the absolute, it returns to the continuum of consciousness in the pool of limitless, timeless perception that resides there. 
Our consciousness accounts for our body, but it goes way beyond it. According to Bentov's theory, it exists quite apart and outside of reality, beyond space-time with no beginning or end. Reality has a beginning and end because it's contained within time and space, but the fundamental energy and consciousness of it all doesn't. It is eternal. When reality ends, its constituent energy simply returns to infinity within the absolute. Now, what does that actually mean, like, specifically? It's a bit difficult to separate the nuggets of information spread throughout the text, but it's possible. Memory as a function and part of our consciousness has the same eternal character and is preserved. The return of consciousness to the absolute does not imply an extinction of the separate entity which the consciousness organized and sustained in reality. In other words, as we merge and become part of the One, we don't lose our self-knowledge and we continue to perceive. What we do lose is the capability for individual will or choice, since the hologram of thoughts can only be created by energy in motion, while we exist in a state of rest. In the end, there's only pure awareness, an all-knowing infinite continuum of consciousness. The tapes are the primary method through which the people undergo their journey through the gateway process. It has to be said that the speed of which you make progress here is dependent on a variety of variables that are different for each person, for example their sensitivity, general state of mind and if they already have experience with other techniques including some meditative practices, from which the tapes borrow quite a few concepts. I'll highlight a few similarities, but I'll try to keep it light on the spiritualism. The first technique the participants encounter is something called an energy conversion box. They're encouraged to isolate distracting thoughts and concerns and visualize putting them aside. The next step is resonate tuning, achieving a certain resonance throughout the body by the humming of a single note contained in the gateway tapes. That sense of tuning yourselves to a certain vibration reminded me of chanting the syllables corresponding to the different chakras or energy patterns of the universe. The use of humming can also be seen in some practices like Brahmari Pranayam, a meditation technique where you basically create a kind of sensory deprivation by adopting a certain hand gesture, the Shanmukhi Mudra, and then hum like a bee to draw your focus inward. It's also called bee's breath, you can find it pretty easily online. Now after these quote-unquote warm-ups for your mind, we encounter hemisync for the first time. The listener is instructed to systematically relax his body while the tapes introduce forms of white and pink noise. The goal is to reach a hypnagogic state to put us on the threshold of sleep, not quite awake, not asleep, but this in between this liminal state of consciousness. Then we're told to create a kind of energy balloon or force field that mirrors the shape of the cosmic egg. It's supposed to not only improve the flow of energy, but to, and I quote, protect against conscious entities possessing lower energy levels we might encounter later in our journey. Like, that's sus, but alright. We'll get a bit more information on that at the end, but before that, let's take a look at the good stuff or all the advanced techniques you'll be able to pull off in theory. The gateway tapes have this weird power ranking of different levels of focus. The higher your focus level, the more advanced things you're able to do and the more techniques will be at your disposal. They're described as tools for promoting self-discovery and personal growth. Beyond focus 10, you'll get into the advanced techniques. Some of these tools include, but aren't limited to, problem solving, manifestation, using the earth as a charger to boost your energy and heal yourself, creating a literal magic wand which you then can turn into a portal and few remote places astral projection, and of course time travel, because why the fuck not. Okay, so let's go through some of them in a bit more detail. First, problem solving. It sounds normal enough, right? Well, to start off, you have to visualize and then project your problems outward towards the universe. The way it's described in the paper, at least, your higher self then interacts with the universal hologram to find solutions that can come as a kind of holistic vision or noetic insight, like you suddenly just know the answer to a problem without actually knowing why or how you know, but you are certain that it is true. Knowledge can also come in the form of symbols or other forms which you just have to kind of get a feel for in the days following your sessions. Basically, what this technique presupposes is the remembrance from a larger pool of knowledge we can gain access to in these altered states. And that's actually not that far off. Many people from across cultures have come to a similar kind of conclusion. 
Take the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung, for example, who wrote extensively on the subject of the collective unconscious. He later developed symptoms of psychosis and schizophrenia, but instead of getting treatment, he saw that as an excellent opportunity to research the mind of a mentally ill person. That's also where one of his most famous works, The Red Book, comes from, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. This concept of gaining insight from a hidden pool of knowledge also bears resemblance to the Akashic Records, a concept from 19th century theosophy. The Akashic Records are a secret collection of all knowledge from every event, thing or thought that has, does or will ever exist in the universe. A metaphysical library of everything, so to speak. Here too one can see this gaining insight from a place outside yourself. Not exactly the same thing, but one could even cite ancient Greek texts from Socrates. He describes learning or gaining insight as a process of remembering knowledge from within oneself, gained over countless past lives and the time the soul has spent in all planes of existence, both earthly and ethereal. But that's enough for this tangent, we gotta move on. By the way, if you want to hear more about any of the things I mention here, just let me know and I'll maybe make a video about it, I don't know. Color breathing has, despite its name, not so much to do with breathing as it has with different effects on the mind and body. So they can be used to heal yourself or to replenish energy resources from the Earth's own electromagnetic field. That's why I described it as using the Earth as a kind of charging cable. The paper gives us the example of using blue light to reduce swelling as opposed to red or yellow which have either the opposite or no effect. In color breathing, however, it's not the use of an external physical light source, but rather your mind's eye that has an effect. To what extent that's actually practical, I can't say. I haven't tried it myself, so you can just take that and anything I say basically with a grain of salt here. The next one is a bit different. I think the text has an interesting take on the theory, so I just quote it here. Magic wands and enchanted scepters have been part of the folklore and occult practices of many cultures. The scepters, staffs and maces carried by monarchs and high priests occur with such a frequency in history as to suggest that, at the very least, these items are an aspect of some type of archetypal symbol which the human mind seems to appreciate, perhaps quite subliminally. Now what you do is, you basically imagine a dot of light and charging it up with energy. Then you extend it into the shape of a sparkling, vibrating cylinder of energy, which you then can channel force from the universe. In other related techniques, it's also used to heal parts of your body. It's also important for the next one, which is remote viewing. With this magic wand, you can create a kind of portal or gate, a whirling vortex you step into and send your mind to the destination it wants to go to, to gain specific information. It's one of the points of interest of the CIA, but I'll get more into that in just a sec when we talk about astral projection. Perhaps the most interesting and elusive practice within the gateway process is traveling into the past and future. Conveniently, these two are also the most difficult things to achieve according to the gateway's weird power ranking scale. They are also somewhat brushed over in the paper, which is a bit annoying. For time travel into the past, you need a state of consciousness called Focus 15 which, according to the Monroe Institute, is only achieved by about 5% of the participants within the 7-day time span of the experiment. More subliminal suggestions and even more expanded consciousness, the paper stays very vague on the actual process of time travel, and it gets even more sparse with traveling into the future. For this, you need the truly advanced S-tier consciousness of Focus 21. It's unlikely to occur and you need to have either prior conditioning through meditation or months to year-long practice in the gateway tapes to even have a chance of experiencing this technique. Beyond that we get nothing. No description of the actual process, no hints whatsoever. It's kinda like the shiny Pokemon of the gateway process. But without beating ourselves down even further, let's get to something more accessible. Out-of-body movement, OBM for short, or astral projection, is an interesting one. It's the reason I came across the gateway process in the first place and it seems to be the main reason why the CIA got interested in the Monroe tapes as well. And for good reason. If it actually worked consistently, the military use of bilocation, remote viewing and overall espionage made possible by OBM would be remarkable. Missions could be carried out and assisted with accurate information on a target's location or others without having to physically endanger any personnel. There was a rather obscure task force that acted under the name of the Stargate Project, which tried to employ some of the Gateway's tools for military operations. 
However, the project was terminated and declassified in 1995 after it yielded no useful information in a significant way, according to the CIA. Information was often vague and unreliable. That was confirmed by tests done by the Monroe Institute themselves, where they tested the accuracy of OBM and remote viewing with an experiment. In one location, a participant would undergo the gateway process and then, with the use of astral projection, move to a second location where they had to read a sequence of 10 numbers on a screen. They never got them quite right and the experiment was called a failure. As to why the results were so unreliable, the researchers at the institute came up with the idea that when in this astral realm, distortions from thoughts, other energy patterns and the influence of other times overlapped with the participant's experience. Now, aside from all that historical context, how does out-of-body movement actually work? In theory, when you have aligned your own electromagnetic field with that of your surroundings, through all of the frequency entrainment stuff we talked about at the beginning, it's possible to detach from your body and move outside it without much resistance. A couple of techniques can be used for that separation, like rolling out, sliding out of your body to one side, or imagining pulling yourself up out of your body by an invisible rope. Have fun trying that out. The paper comes up with an interesting side note. Most of us are already able to perform out-of-body movement when we are in the stages of REM sleep. That's because a few of the conditions for OBM in a waking state are already present in REM sleep. Firstly, during that stage the body's motor cortex functions are deactivated. Only breathing and eye movement continue unimpaired, the rest is like paralyzed. It's an evolutionary safeguard, so we don't physically act out what we experience in our dreams. We can talk and jump and run around without our bodies responding to the stimuli. That intense relaxation also eliminates the bifurcation echo of the heart, which is critical for achieving the right resonance or frequency that we need to achieve these altered states. The second condition for OBM that is met in REM sleep is the quieting of the left brain hemisphere. The only thing missing is the synchronization of the right and left hemisphere during the gateway process. Nevertheless, the practice of lucid dreaming and consciously remembering your dreams helps to strengthen your connection and the recollection of the experience of OBM. Replicating this state in waking consciousness is a different matter though. The paper leaves us with a rather cryptic message. Indeed, it may even be postulated that some dreams associated with deep levels of sleep are in fact functions of the same kind of altered consciousness that plays a role in all of the focused 12, 15 and 21 states. Whatever that means is up to your interpretation. Most of the recent revival of interest in the gateway process has to do with the following section of the paper, tucked away under 24 pages of laborious groundwork. Almost at the end of the paper, the author MacDonald discusses Gateway's implications for different religious systems and comes to a rather tame conclusion. The principles behind Gateway, the universal Taurus and the symbolism contained within all the material is surprisingly or unsurprisingly compatible with many of the world religions today. Both the image of the cosmic egg and the concept of our visible reality being a creation of some omniscient unseen divinity is inferred in both Eastern and Judeo-Christian belief systems. The Christian concept of the Trinity as well as the Hebrew tree of life are concepts that harmonize with Gateway's view of reality. The description of energy totally at rest in infinity fits the Christian metaphysical concept of the Father, while the infinite self-consciousness that provides the will to bring a portion of that energy in motion corresponds with the Son. The text builds up to its climax at the end of page 24. It ends with this passage. And the eternal thought or concept of self which results from this self-consciousness serves the... And then it just... stops. Page 25 nowhere to be found, as if the author hadn't just revealed the ultimate secret to existence. Now, the mystery of the missing page 25 was a point of much debate in the last years. Many people contacted the CIA and filed motions for the release of the page, with no result. The CIA wouldn't budge, said they never had it in the first place. Some internet theories had it that the page was left out intentionally by McDonald's or Monroe himself, a kind of litmus test. Whoever actually completed the training and transcended time and space would be able to locate the missing page. But like so often in life, things would end up being not so mysterious after all. An excellent article written by Toby Campion from Vice came forth and it was revealed that they had received the missing page in the mail. Turns out the Monroe Institute has had it all this time and no one ever came up with the idea to just ask them. 
after the topic and especially Campion's first article on the gateway process gained traction on TikTok and other social media, the institute reached out to them and arranged the publication of page 25. I recommend you check out the original article, it's worth it in my opinion. So what does the missing page tell us? Basically it continues the parallel to the Christian trinity, the soul or holy spirit creating time and space as a means to interact with the universal hologram. The page also sets a focus on self-discovery, know thyself, the basic axiom of all knowledge. Before confronting the world one has to look inward and see what he can discover there. In McDonald's words, this would seem to be one of the real promises of the gateway experience, its ability to provide a portal through which, based on months if not years of practice, the individual may pass in his search to find self, personal effectuality and truth in the larger sense and in that it may be a slow but ultimately rewarding process, because you don't need to have infinite patience and faith in a certain belief system or deity. Even the impatient, result-oriented, skeptical pragmatists can achieve a better understanding of themselves and the world around them through the use of the gateway method. Before we end this video, I want to mention a few things. The paper itself ends with a kind of anecdotal listing of a step-by-step -step guide for the most promising method of reaching altered states, and a few things I just have to mention, it would be a waste not to. That includes the multi-focus approach, in which three people go into astral projection at the same time. One stays in this space-time and watches the bodies, while the other two go into the past and future respectively. If they all entered the altered state at the same time, they would ideally share one energy grid and are supposed to be able to tune into each other's perception for more accurately receiving information. The other two things are a bit ominous, but I just found it hilarious how they were like hidden away at the very end of the paper. Number one, be intellectually prepared to react to possible encounters with intelligent non-corporeal energy forms when time-space boundaries are exceeded. And number two, Arrange to have groups of people in Focus 12 state unite their altered consciousness to build holographic patterns around sensitive areas to repulse possibly unwanted out-of-body presences. Like, my man, what are you not telling us? Why do we have to build energy fields around us to protect us from intelligent, non-corporeal beings? Where are the aliens at? Anyway, I just found that was interesting. Now, that concludes this whole mega project of mine. One last thing before I sign off maybe. I know all of this was a bit of a logical leap of faith, but if you want to hear my opinion on the gateway process, I think it's not so much about understanding the concept from an intellectual point of view. You know, the left brain thinking the paper dumps on so much. I'm not saying anything the gateway paper discusses is real or fake or anything like that. That wasn't my intention making this video. It's more like, hey, look at this cool thing I found on the internet, and yeah. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive, it was a bit longer than my usual stuff, but if you want to see more of that kind in the future, just let me know. Alright, that's it. Have a safe trip.